shapes, um, adding those textures into our scene, making them look uh, more realistic. Um, the next step though is adding this to a different shape. Um, so I'm just going to copy my preferences and open up Maya. So remember I have my preferences here saved. I'm deleting the Maya ones and pasting in the new ones and then opening Maya. Um, so our original shape that we started with in this is a sphere and every texture we create inside of Photoshop and then we bring into Maya and drop on there. It has a pretty good wrapping around of how it's laying out. Uh, let me just set my project, open it up. Yeah, there, done. Oops, not the right one, that one. There we go. All right, so this is where we left off with the last one. Um, I was showing the glowing on here by just assigning the other material to it. Number five, I believe, yes. There it is. All right, so last class we went into Photoshop and we took these textures for metal and we brought it into Photoshop and we adjusted it. Um, we took off some of the material properties of the thing, like it had some screws and bolts on it. We erased those from the mix. And then we went through and created a ref, uh, bump map, and then we created a reflection map. And then we can use those two things to help enhance the look of this thing. Now if I drop this onto a plane, so I'm just going to take my sphere and hide it just so you can see. is and so I'm just going to assign that same material to a plane and right away we can see that it definitely lays out correctly okay that image from Photoshop that we created dropped onto the material it lays perfectly on a plane okay if I try to go with any other kind of shape though besides a plane or a cute or a sphere uh, I'm most likely going to get some issues so let's just say I drop it on a cube There it is. Okay, now dropping it on the cube, we're definitely not getting the results that we would expect. Um, you can definitely tell in some of these areas, like right here, this texture looks like it's going this way and then down here, but it, it looks weird because this one's going up, like it should be going both ways, right? Or, or some sort of mix of that. So a cube, when we add a texture to it, does not lay out the texture as nicely as a default sphere or a default plane does. The problem with all the surfaces we're ever going to use is it's very rare we're just going to have a sphere or a plane that we would assign a material to. Usually it's going to be something that we've modeled. Okay, so let's say that I had, let's just delete the cube. Let's say I had a cylinder. There it is. And again, I'll assign that same material to it. And again, we'll look at it when it renders. You'll see that again, the material does not lay out correctly. Even in this one, it actually looks like these rust spots, instead of going up and down, they're going like sideways, which really doesn't make a lot of sense, seeing as how this is sitting up and down, okay? So the, the reason for this is that every 3D object when we put a 2D image on it or a 2D texture on it, it has to convert it into some sort of, of space, okay? So in the intro class, we kind of just kind of touched on this a little bit, um, but every surface that we put a, sur a texture on, it goes through this process of UV editing, okay? So this, let me try to squeeze everything out of my monitor here. So this cylinder here gets unwrapped and looks like this. So this is obviously the bottom, that's the top up there, and then this is the main body of it. 
And if you look at the main body of it, it's actually pretty small in comparison to the rest of the shape. Um, this is basically just like a cutout. Like if we were to take a cylinder and we cut the top off, cut the bottom off, sliced it down the side, and we could lay out all of these things like a puzzle, that's what we're looking at, okay? And in order for Maya to take our 3D object and make it have a texture on there, it has to do that, all right? So this is what the default cylinders UVs look like. If you make a sphere, there it is. Here's what the default sphere UV layout looks like. So let me just scoot you over for a second. Let me bring my sphere back. And let's look at the UVs. Okay, so here's the UVs for this one. So overall, this looks like it's pretty good. Um, if I did go like into this pole area though, you can definitely see how I'm getting some distortion happening right there at the center, okay? And actually the whole thing has distortion. There's only a couple of small areas that don't have any distortion. If you look at this here, so you look at this face, when we look at a face here, it should really represent the same shape and size of a face inside of this, but it doesn't. So this shape out here is pretty rectangle. This one is square, okay? So what that tells me is that my texture is actually getting stretched in that area. Now if I look at a plane, let me just zoom out and create a plane. Okay, all of these are square here. Let's look at the UVs for it. All the UVs are square. So the plane is the only shape that we're ever going to get that's going to be perfect right away, okay? Even if I were to add more divisions to the plane, like that, it automatically balances that out, all right? So if I grab, oopsie daisy, if I grab one of these, you can see that this shape right here matches that shape right there. So regardless of what I do to this plane, as far as adding divisions, they're going to be perfect. Now, once I start shaping this out and start deforming it, let's say I just grab that and scoot it off and then stretch this out, you'll see that those don't change at all, okay? When I change the shape of a surface, I need to change the UVs too. So one of the steps that we're gonna need to do on a lot of our surfaces, because we're not gonna always be working with just a sphere or just a plane, is that we're gonna have to lay out UVs, all right? So uh, we're gonna use a different texture for this. Uh, UV texture. All right, and these are really cool ones you can use. These are all different kinds that people have used. Um, ideally, what we want to do is find one that has a gradient in it. So a gradient, and then something that also has numbers in it so that we can tell where things are repeating or where um, certain things are. Um, something like this is very difficult to use because you can't tell if something is facing the correct way. If I'm looking at it, um, this texture upside down or whatever doesn't really make sense. Um, something like this is nice because it's kind of small. Um, this is nice because, you know, it's really obvious where things are. Um, I think I'm going to go with that one. Oops, not that one. Now we did number gradient. I'm on the gradient one. That one. Alright, so I'm just going to save this image into my folder. And this isn't something you would ever use like in your portfolio. This is just a... This is just something we would use to lay out the texture coordinates, okay? Now it's important that we are able to do this because as we start working on surfaces, typically what the workflow is, is we're gonna model something, then we're gonna lay out the UVs, and then we're gonna texture it, okay? So if we have a human head, we have to texture that some way. Um, and just to show you, I actually downloaded a human head. Well, it's not a human head, it's a head. It looks kinda neat. And there he is. Right, row 
Search page. I'm gonna shrink it down a little bit. There. All right. So here's this head that I found um, on Turbo Squid. Okay. So it's a pretty interesting looking head. If I were to try to put this metal material, the same metal I had on the sphere and the cube and the plane, on him, it's basically a mess. It doesn't look too bad right here, except for look at you can see like basically. <laughs> There's the texture, there's the texture, there's the texture. Every single one of his faces is basically a repeat of that metal texture. So if I'm trying to take my character and make him look metallic using this metal texture we created, I can't do it. It's just not with the current setup anyway. Okay, and just for fun, I'll render it just so you can see how messed up the texture actually is. Now over the years, they've made the whole texturing process a lot easier. Um, there's a whole bunch of tools now. Yeah, look at them. <laughs> okay, so you can see they're stretched out here. They're bunched up there. They're patchy all over the place, so it's obviously does not work. Makes me think of someone uh, uh, welding it together. Right. Uh, where did my other things go? Who hit them? Didn't you delete them? Oh, I did, didn't I? Dang it. Whatever. Uh, did you do? That's fine. I'll just bring up the cube. Nice. All right. All right. So anytime we texture stuff, um, what I like to do is I like to have just a version of a material that I could just drop on there and see what that looks like. Okay. So I'm. Uh, let me create a uh, plane too, just so we can see it. So I don't do this for everyone. This is just for simple demo purposes of what we're going to be doing. All right, so let me grab all of these. I'm gonna create a surface shader, okay? A surface shader is basically no distortion of color, okay? Meaning there's no highlights or reflections or anything. It's literally whatever you put into it, it's as bright as it can be. So when I click on the map here and I go to file, and I find my texture, what did I call there to give you that? <laughs> Somewhere in there. All right. So now we'll hit six. There we go. All right. So here's the plane, and you can see what it looks like. That's what it should look like. So by looking at this, if this is upside down, I know that any material that I put on this is going to be upside down because my wording is upside down. So let's pretend that I had a billboard. If my UVs are upside down, when I put that texture of a billboard on there, that billboard picture is going to be upside down. Okay, So I know that I either have to rotate this or rotate the UVs. Look at his. Holy cow. That's incredibly messed up. All right, so we'll do the uh, easy one first, which is this cube. Okay, Now if we look at the cube's UVs, and in the UV editor, I'm going to go to image and dim the image. Sometimes I'll even turn it off just so it's easier to see. And I guess that was the best one. Um, looking at this, these are the UV. So basically every part of this cube is laid out, okay? There's not really a whole lot to a cube that I could do to lay it out any better, all right? Um, you're never gonna be able to stitch every single side. Have you ever seen like clothing before they actually stitch all the clothing together? It's just like a flat mess. That's what it's going to be. It's going to be a flat mess. If you look at this cube shape here, if we had that as a printout, we could cut it out and then we could fold it and recreate the cube. That's what every single UV shape is going to be. Some way that we could stitch this thing back together um, to create it if we needed to, okay? So this represents that. Now, as we lay out the UVs, we want to look for Q, uh, squares. So when we look at the texture here, all of these should be square. We also want to look at the sizing, okay? This box up here, this top right quadrant, that's where our texture is gonna go. So we want to use that as much as we can to maximize our texture. Just as an example, let me take my UVs and shrink it down. All right, so these are still laid out the exact same way as far as sizing goes, um, but they're just super tiny now, okay? So if I was to create a texture 
in order for me to get any detail in that, the texture would have to be super high resolution because the, te the UVs are so tiny. Now, if I go back to where it was, <clears throat> right here, there's a lot more area that I could fit inside here, all right? Now, one of the things you're gonna say is, well, who cares? I can make a huge texture. I can go into Photoshop and make this texture be 7,000 pixels or 10,000 pixels or 20,000 pixels. It's not a big deal, but it is a big deal because in Maya, it has to open up all these textures. And as it opens the textures up and writes the things, it uses memory. So the more memory, the slower the render times and the um, possible ability that the software could crash, okay? So we want to make sure that each one of these texture areas is maximized as best as can be. Now if we look at like the UVs of um, like a character, oops, I wanted that one. This is a character's UV layout. Okay, look at how everything on here basically has a place for where that character could be laid out. Okay, you can see, let me zoom in on here, you can see where the head is, you can see where the hands are, you can see where the bottoms of the shoes are, you can see where this is probably his torso, these might be his legs, possibly, and I'm not sure what half the other stuff is. Okay, <laughs> yeah. That could be the neck. That's the neck here or there. I don't know. Um, something something. But the point is that they've maximized this, okay? When we bring in a texture, we want to bring in as few textures as possible and as small of a size as possible. And the way we get across that is by maximizing our usage, okay? So when we have a texture, now imagine that we're in Photoshop and we bring in this texture into Photoshop as we paint one of these areas we're painting pixels. So if this is, let's just give it a number of a thousand pixels. If this is a thousand pixels going across and a thousand pixels going up, this area here is only a few pixels, right? Because every one of these lines is a hundred pixels. So this is like half of a line. So that's 50 pixels. How much color information could you fit inside of 50 pixels? Not very much. If this was as big as this entire thing, we could fit a thousand pixels in there, right? But then we would have to load in a thousand pixels for every single one of those parts and it just wouldn't be realistic. All right, so as we do any of our UV layout, we're always trying to maximize our usage of this. So I know from experience that that layout there is not the best layout to maximize our stuff. We can make these a little bit bigger. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to go to edge. So I just right click inside here and I'm gonna grab these edges. Okay, and right now anywhere they're touching, they're connected, okay? So these edges that I picked, they're, so, they're already connected so I can't move the individual faces. I'm gonna to go to polygon and I'm gonna to go to cut UV. All right, so now these are cut. So now each one of these pieces is a separate shape that I could then move. So I'm gonna right click and go to shell, click and go to move and just scoot that down. I'm gonna click this one, move it, and put that about there. I like to give a little bit of room between these. I don't want them right on top of each other. That's good. And then I'll scoot this one over a little bit, okay? Now that I've laid it out like this, I can go to scale and scale the entire thing up. There we go. Okay. Now that wasn't incredibly drastic. That was just a bit more. But now these look a lot different. Okay. We fit more texture on there. You want to fit as many of these squares on here as you can. Here's another one that I just put right next to it. Where'd you go? Let me drop that same material on there. So here it was before. See how square, how big these squares are? And now these are a bit smaller. The smaller they are, the more texture we can fit into them. So that one is pretty much laid out, okay? There's not much more I can do to a cube to add more texture area to it, okay? Now let me go to this cylinder here. 
and the cylinder is really messed up. These are not squares at all. These are rectangles. These are square, Oops. the bottom square, but this area here is not square at all. That needs to be square. So I'm going to grab the faces here and what I can do is inside my UV editor, actually I'll just go to shell, I can scale this up. And as I scale that up you can see that they're turning into squares. And it's pretty close to about there. Okay. We're thinking, we're thinking. There we go. All right, so now I have squares here and I have squares there. Now the next thing I need to be aware of is the size of each of these. So these squares need to be the same size as those squares. Imagine that you had a character and he had a huge texture on his head, but on his rest of his body he had a small texture. Okay, what that would mean is that this looks really blocky, this looks really smooth, so the inconsistency happening. So using this size here, we can judge that as the size of it. So if I see that these um, are too big or too small or whatever, I can resize it. So if I go to shell, I can scale this down. I can't really scale it up because I'll go outside the box and that's a no-no. Okay, I can't do that. That's a no-no. It goes right there. Okay. Now I could also kind of rearrange these too. Like I could rotate this over here to the side. I could pull these over here. All right, so now what this gives me, just kind of rearranging them, <laughs> is I could actually add multiple textures into the same thing. So if I have, let's say I had a Mountain Dew bottle and I had a Coke bottle, okay? And I needed basically labels for each one. Instead of making a Coke texture and bringing it in and a Mountain Dew texture and bringing it in, I could make one image that has both and just use the UVs as a way to assign those materials, okay? Now let's look at this guy here. <laughs> look at his UVs. Just, it's a block. You can't even see it. <laughs> it's just white. It's a tiny bit of openings right the there. Mesh. That's the mesh, yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is from ZBrush, and this is actually down leveled from the original. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we'll just see what happens with this. Um, I may need to go to even a lower resolution. Now the reason I show this one is because it's too dense to even try to set up a good UV on it because of how he is. Um, but it's a good practice just to kind of see it. So one of the things we can do is, um, where am I at? Planar mapping, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna planar map this guy. So what that means is I'm gonna basically project this texture straight onto him. All right. Um, in the intro class, we had a couple objects where we just planar mapped or cylindrical mapped a couple things. That's what we're going to do here. So I'm just going to say project this in the Z direction because he's kind of facing the Z, and then project. And where do you go? Let's try that again. Planar map Z. The fact that it's going slow now means it's working. Okay, so now we have the side view of the projection. So if I switch back to object mode real quick, and I look at that side view, that side view looks pretty good because it's projected like that. Imagine that we had the projector on the ceiling and we had this picture as our image. If I stick my hand up, it's projecting it right onto my hand. The problem is though, the back doesn't get projected good and the sides here are all streaking because it doesn't have a good quality image on the side of it. So what we need to do is I need to lay this out obviously a bit better than just projecting it one direction. So uh, one of the things I'm gonna do is this is my projection here. So I projected it like that. I'm gonna click on this little T. There's a tiny red T in the corner. I'm gonna click on it. There it goes. And that turns this circle thing on. So I can click on the circle, and then I can rotate this. And as I rotate it, 
it's going to rotate how it's projecting onto the surface. So I want to project it basically, oops, too far. It is going super slow. Yes, it is. Yeah, 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 let's say about there. Cool. All right. So about there seems like it's a good spot to be in. Okay. So again, we're right head on. We're good. But the sides are going to streak. The back is okay um, in some spots, but you can see that they're actually backwards. So that's not good. All right, so now what I need to do, holy cow, this is incredibly dense. Um, <laughs> just to try this out, I'm going to go to the edge in the center, and I'm going to double click. Now that got me pretty much all the way around, it looks like, at least. So I'm going to cut that. <laughs> Are we good? Yes, OK. So now he's cut. So now I'm going to try to go in here and just say unfold. Okay. Now, like I said, he is too complex for us to be trying this on, especially in Maya. ZBrush does have some pretty good tools that allow you to do it to a character like this. Um, but Maya's defaults are not meant for this. Maya wants super duper low resolution um, to work on. Yeah. So you can see it down here chugging along. It says unfolding UV is 1% press escape to cancel. We're going to hit just escape to cancel because there's no way it's going to be able to do that. <laughs> OK, well, we can use these same techniques on other models that will allow us to do it, obviously, much quicker. Nope. Not on my station. And with Cinema 4D, I have a harder time uh, navigating all the tools. But by the time I figure them out, then I have to go to this class and I have to refigure out these tools. There we go. OK. So now we have some divisions in here. I'm going to extrude this. Nope. There we go. Extrude that. Extrude this. There we go. So now here's a shape. Now, all of these streaks here, that's a common thing that you're going to see because as you start extruding stuff, it doesn't know how to lay out the UVs for that new area. So what it does, it just stretches it. So whatever color was there, like green is on this side, if I extrude this down, green is the color that gets streaked. As I extrude this out, green is that same color getting streaked. Okay. Then I'm going to go through and smooth it. Mesh smooth. There we go. So now we have some weird object here, and the texturing on it is not laid out correctly. Now, in some cases, you're never going to be able to lay it out perfectly that you'll be able to use it and paint on it inside of Photoshop. There's just some surfaces you won't be able to do that to. Um, this surface, we can kind of get some areas where we could do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same kind of thing. I'm going to do a planar map to this. OK, and that kind of lays out part of it, at least. Um, I think I want to go in the different direction, though. Let me go in the Y direction. I think it might be easier to see. There we go. So now it's planar mapped it from the above. Now, if we look too, this isn't really laid out correctly. This is more of a rectangle, and they should all be square because our texture is square. So if I scale this up, that gives me more square shapes than rectangle shapes. All right, so now let's look at it in the UV texture editor. There it is. So that's it from the top. Now I need to start cutting it up because if I took this shape, somehow it has to get cut up to lay flat. So I'm going to go to my edges, and I'm just going to select a couple edge areas here. Okay. Imagine this is, again, an actual 3D object. How would I cut this in order to lay it down flat? That's what I'm looking for. That should be good there. I'm going to go to polygons. I'm going to say cut UV edges. Okay. I'm going to go back to uh, object mode and say unfold. And it unfolds it. Okay. Now, the unfolding part was pretty, it actually works pretty good. Okay. Um, the surface pieces are not going to blend together. 
meaning you'll see that there's a seam right here. You'll see that there's a seam right here and right here. For a shape like this, that's the pretty much the best I could hope for, okay? Because something like this, I wouldn't paint inside of Maya, all right? And I would never just kind of go into my materials, drop that metal on, and hope for the best because I know I'm going to get stuff like this. I'm going to get these areas where the dark and the light are going to meet and it's going to look kind of funky. The point of doing this is that I want uniformity. I want everything to have squares all over it. Okay, and if I get an area where I don't like what's happening, I can grab it, cut the UV edges, go back to object mode, and back to unfold. And it'll cut those areas out and unfold them differently. Okay, so some things we need that to happen. You could also look in here and see if there's an area there where there's um, something weird happening. Okay, I actually cut them in pretty good spots. Uh, where I'm not getting any real stretching in here, which is really nice. Yeah, I'm not really seeing any, you know, weird shapes. Everything looks pretty square. If I want to double check it, I can go to my UVs, grab everything, and even scale it up bigger. And sometimes just having it as a bigger um, image, even though we wouldn't use it like that, that's way too big. that gives us a good idea if we are getting any kind of stretching somewhere and no it looks like it's pretty uniform all over okay so I'm just gonna put it back to where it was now here's what I was saying before this is a picture this is a texture from Photoshop if I were to take one of these pieces like this one and I shrunk it down really tiny you can see how big the numbers are okay so what would happen is this textured area would be nice and clean. This textured area would be really grainy. You can see how horrible that looks. So I need to make sure that all of these are nice and uniform. Okay. So every object I use, I, the new workflow I've been using is just this unfold and just specifying things. So let me grab the cylinder now and I'll show you. So I'm going to um, use one of these first. So I use one of these basic um, projections, cylinder, planar, or spherical. I very rarely use spherical. It's either planar or cylindrical. So I'm going to use cylindrical because it's a cylinder. I don't care what this looks like. And I know that I'm going to need to cut this. So I'm going to go to edge. I'm going to double click the edge along here. Shift, double click the edge along here. And go to polygons, cut. Once that's cut, then I can go back to oops, object mode, back to polygons, back to unfold, and it unfolds it. Now, this didn't cut all the way around, so something missed. So I grab that, that's right. Grab this, polygons, cut. So that should have worked. Unfold. It may want me to cut it along here too, so we'll just do that. Cut UV edges, unfold, there we go. And if it keeps giving me trouble still, which it is, I'm just gonna grab this piece and just do a planar map on it. Okay, this way it forces it basically to separate from the rest of the surface. There we go. So then I can go back to unfold, and there it is. Okay. Now if we look, there's actually some other stuff going on here. Like, that's why this didn't work before, because this edge is still connected. Where's that edge at? It's hidden behind one of those many walls you have on there. Yes, it is. Right here. Okay. So I'm going to go to this edge right here and cut it again. Okay, there we go. And then I'll go back to my layout, unfold, cool. All right, so now it laid it out. Now this area here where I have these extra pieces, let me shrink that down and scoot it over. See how these don't blend together? I have tiny squares here, big squares here, big squares there. I need all of those to blend together. 
So over here, these are all separate. Okay, so they're all three separate pieces. I want to put all those pieces back together. So right clicking going to edge. As I highlight inside here, you can see how I highlight this edge. This other edge on the left side is highlighting. Those two edges are essentially the same edge in 3D. This edge right here, okay? So if I click on that and go to polygons, move and sew, it puts those together. I'll do the same thing here, polygons, move and sew, and the same thing here, polygons, move and sew. Okay, now I'll grab the object again. I'll go back to unfold, and there we go. So now the only thing I have left to do is to grab um, these two pieces and kind of move them down here, and grab these piece, this piece, and just scale it up, okay, until they're all about the same size. Now what I'm gonna have to do, I think, is just scale this one bigger than that square, and then scale all these together. There we go, okay? So now this is the fundamentals of everything we're gonna be doing with UV stuff. So what I want you to do is create a cylinder. We're gonna do one together now, okay? All right, and then once you have that, assign a new surface shader to your uh, cylinder. And then you're just gonna map that same file texture. That's fine. Okay, so on the color area, map that file texture, that um, checkerboard. Okay, now like I said before, for the most part, your cylinder, a default cylinder, let me make a default one, not that one. For the most part, this default cylinder is going to come in with pretty good um, UVs. We would just have to tweak the center, but I want you to see that process from start to finish. And then we'll create a couple other shapes that we could also um, build from start to finish. All right, so what we need to do is we need to create a, basically we need to cut the surface up, okay? Um, so I know that there's going to be three parts to this. We're going to have the body part, we're going to have the top cap, and we're going to have the bottom cap. So if I right click on this and go to face, so you do that, right click and go to face, and then you can marquee the faces straight down the center. Okay, so that gives us the selection of all those cylinder faces. Then we can go to UV and just do cylinder. Okay. Perfect. All right, we don't have to adjust it any further. All we have to do is tell it that it's cylindrical. Then we're gonna grab the top faces and the bottom faces. So if you're kind of clever about how you have this um, angled, you can pretty much just marquee right at the center and grab both of them. Okay, and before you do anything after that, go to wireframe just to verify that you only have the top and the bottom selected. All right, so now we need to planar map these. Now, it doesn't really matter which way we planar map them. I just like to make sure it's done the, you know, the direction it should be. So if we go back to UV, go back to planar map, um, we're gonna go to the Y direction, okay? So go to UV, go to planar map, choose the option box, and then you can choose Y, and that will project it straight down. Okay, so now we have this cylinder that has uh, the projection like that. Cool? All right, so let's go back to object mode. Let's go to Window UV Texture Editor. And we should have something similar to what I have. Okay. Now make sure you're in object mode, and then you're just gonna go to polygons and say unfold. Okay, inside of the UV editor. 
All right, so um, this is a, a point of interest if you're on a lower version of Maya at home. In 2016 extension two, you don't have to select stuff before you go, to, I mean, you don't have to be in component mode when you go to unfold, okay? When you're in extension two, you don't have to do that. Anything before, you have to make sure that you've grabbed the shells and then gone to unfold. So if you're on a different version, like, I don't know, are you on extension two yet? No. Did you have to do that? No? Let's just sort of that. <laughs> Maybe she's on 15. I don't know. Um, anyway, it may have to do it, whatever. So um, to see your stuff better, go to image and display your image off in the texture editor. Okay, that way you can actually see the UVs without the texture. Sometimes that texture just beating at you can be a little bit blinding. Um, so then the next step we want to do is just resize this. Everyone's stuff is going to be at a different size. Um, so you're going to right click and go to shell. And what that's going to do is allow you to select the individual pieces. Now your caps, the top cap and the bottom cap should be the same size. So don't resize those separately. This piece here should be a different size obviously than these because they're different shaped. When we scale it, we never grab these. Never, ever, ever do that because it stretches it. We don't want to stretch it. When we scale, we grab the centered bit and we scale it down or we scale it up. So now what we want to do is grab these, scale them so that they're the same size as the other one. Okay, so I'm shrinking these down and it's going to be confusing for uh, a bit. Um, shrinking these down until they fit that same size. Okay. So make sure that both these squares and these squares are the same size. If I undo a step here, do you see how mine is right at the edge right here? I don't even want them right at the edge because when we create a texture, sometimes there's a little bit of feathering that happens at the edges. I want to push that in a little bit. Okay. So go to your scale and just scale it in just a hair. Okay, so I just scaled it in a hair and then just moved it up a little bit too just to kind of center it better. Now, if this was something where we um, we were short on resources, okay, some things are you're short on resources. Um, if you ever seen a 3D model on your phone or a 3D model in a video game, those are heavily relied on resources because in a video game, you might have 20 or 30 or 40 different assets in one area that are all trying to render it real time, okay? And so if you have too many textures in there, it could really become an issue. So one thing that you could do in certain instances is this. I could take this thing here and I could cut it. You're not gonna do this, but I'm showing you. And then I could slide this down. I should have gone one more over. There we go. Let's go one more over, cut it. There we go. So I can slide that down. And now I can scale this up to get more texture inside of that area, okay? Again, if you're short on resources and you don't want to, um, and you can do this kind of thing, feel free to do it, okay? But in some instances, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. If I'm doing a label, it wouldn't make sense to do a label because then I would have this label that's like cut in half for these two spots. But let's say I'm doing the front and back of an item, right? So let's say it's shampoo bottle or something front label, back label, two completely different things they don't need to be touching, something like that would work perfectly fine, okay? And that way I can capture more resolution in those images. If I have a bunch of fine text, I need that to be readable. So I need to make sure I have big enough UVs that I could read the text on there, okay? All right, cool. All right, so every shape that we do is gonna be essentially that exact same thing, okay? Um, there are certain cases where you might do something different just so you can see something else where you know Specifically to this item 
let's say I had this guy here and I wanted to make a crate okay so there's a quick way for me to create a crate okay and if I put a that same surface shader on there it doesn't work out too good um, now if I went to automatic mapping this is another one that I'll use um, occasionally what automatic mapping will do is it basically does a planar projection from every direction okay so there's a planar map from above below this way this way this way this way and what that gives us is um, everything's laid out if I go back to the UVs for this that's what it looks like now this could be a little bit confusing because we see so much stuff here where it's like geez I don't know where anything is really at um, with the cylinder here we know where things are this is one side that's the other side there's a top there's the bottom okay here all of those edges all those faces are basically separated okay um, so sometimes we'll use automatic mapping just because for this it's kind of easier to do but if I were to put like a wood texture on here uh, I don't think we did wood yet There we go. So if I put this wood texture on here, you can see, sure, this looks like wood, but the issue with it is that the wood doesn't look like it should be looking on the surface. Not only because I picked a horrible wood for this. Let me pick a different one. That one looks pretty good. Okay. That one's a little bit better, but how this surface, how this crate would be created is a bit different. Okay. Um, if I was to actually build a crate and I wanted it to look like a crate, the wood grain for this stuff wouldn't be going horizontally, it'd be going with the wood, okay? So something like this, I would do manually. I would literally go through and just do planar map, planar map, planar map, planar map, and just manually position each one. So just to show you one side of how I would do this, I would grab these two and I would go to UVs, I would say planar map, I would say go in the Z direction because that's the direction these faces are facing. And then I would have to rotate it. So I rotate it 90 degrees. There it is. Now maybe I'll stretch it in just to give a little bit more grain to it. And then I would grab, the, those two look like they're okay. I would grab this. I would go to planar map again. That's good there. <clears throat> this side here and this side here should also be going um, vertically instead of horizontally. That's not the right one. So I'll rotate this one. That's good. And then the same thing with this side and that side. I'll rotate it 90 degrees. And now that looks nice. And then I'll go up to this one here and that one there. Is there a reason why you wouldn't do that outside of the lip and the inside of the lip together? What, what? Oh, up here and down here? Yeah. Uh, no, you could. You definitely could. The only thing I would be concerned about is if I do too many things at the same spot, mm -hmm. that they would look the, the same. So if like this piece here ended up on this, it would also end up on that. So then I would have like a repetition where here I could offset it and move it without touching that one. There we go. Okay. So I would go through this whole thing and lay out that, that way it lines up perfectly. But for, what, uh, for an organic surface, like a face, like anything metal where we have just faces basically going in every different direction. Um, something like that, I would definitely go through and do the previous method of planar mapping and then unfolding, planar mapping and unfolding, okay? And as we get further in the class, we'll expand, uh, explore more of these kinds of things. All right, so now we wanna do something with this cylinder because um, we can have some more fun with it, okay? So our metal, like we talked about before, 
if I put the metal on here, you can see that it doesn't really line up. Here's where that seam is. The texture starts here, or the surface starts here and goes to there. And so when it folds back in, we're getting that seam where those two surfaces are meeting up. And then the same thing on top, these aren't really lining up in the right spot. And same thing on the bottom, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna grab our cylinder and we're going to export it as an OBJ, okay? So under Window, Settings, Preferences, Plugin Manager, make sure your OBJ export is enabled. Okay, Window, Settings, Preferences, Plugin Manager, and then make sure OBJ export is loaded and auto-loaded. If it's loaded, hit close. Okay. Then we're going to go make sure the cylinder is clicked. Um, we're going to go to File Export Selection. And we'll call it just um, Test Cylinder. And we'll save it as an OBJ. Exported. All right, so now you're going to open up a program called Mari. Okay, so if you go to the Start menu, type Mari. Um, the top one here, 3.1 V1, that's the one you want. And what this program is going to allow us to do is paint right onto the surface. So when we're dealing with any kind of surface where we have seams and something like a face, you could see there were seams like all over the place. Um, we need to paint those so that we don't actually have seams. So Mari allows us to basically, when we did a planar map, it planar maps just that side, okay? In Mari, as we're painting with our brush stroke, it's doing like little planar maps to make sure that whatever we're painting is projected on exactly like we're seeing it. So if we have a seam right here and we're planar mapping or projecting or painting it, it doesn't even care. It just paints it the way it should be painted, which is pretty awesome. Okay, so when Mari comes up, um, just as a precursor, it's probably not one of the worst interfaces, but it's definitely different than Maya and different than other programs. All right, so we're going to make a new project in Mari. So we just go to the New tab. And then at the very top, you'll give it a name. So we'll call this um, your last name underscore test cylinder. Okay, the next spot where it says path, that's where it wants you to point to your piece of geometry. So we're gonna click on the arrow thing and we're gonna find our piece of geometry. So wherever you stored your piece of geometry at, go and grab it. This should be your OBJ. Okay. Now once you find your OBJ, it reads information off of it. So it says, uh, what mapping scheme do you want to use? It says UV if available, PTEX otherwise. PTEX is a um, UV layout that Mari uses. Okay. So we want to use our UVs, that's why we set them up. So we're just going to leave that as the default. We can also create groups, which we'll do later on, um, from faces. And then we can also merge multiple geometries into one object or create separate geometries. We're fine merging everything into one, okay? As you start painting things um, inside here, you might bring in, let's say, a car, right? You might bring in the whole car, and that car has 35 or 60 or 100 different parts on it, right? So you want to either keep those separate or have them uh, all together or whatever. All right, so for our root path, we're just going to make a uh, folder on the P drive called temp. Mine already has a folder called temp, but otherwise you can click the plus and then type in temp. Yeah, right on the P drive. That way in case the system crashes, that we'll still have whatever it saves for us. Okay, so you click on that, you go to the P drive, new folder, and temp.
All right, so in Mari, it allows you to do different kinds of maps um, while you're in it. So most of the time in this class, um, unless we get really, really, really fancy, we're just gonna be creating a color map and using everything else to create our other maps from the color map, okay? So uh, we're just gonna say I want to create a color map. And then we have a resolution here. Our cylinder is no big deal at 4096 by 4096 pixels, okay? We're not dealing with inches, we're dealing with strictly pixels. Uh, we could probably even paint this at 32,000 pixels by 32,000, but there's no way Maya would even open that or allow us to do anything with it, okay? So um, the highest one you could go is 8,000 pixels, all right? So we're gonna go to 8,000 pixels. Um, our color space we're gonna leave, our file space we're gonna leave. Um, this fill right here is your default color. What do you want this to be filled with? We'll leave it at that, okay? And then your file name we'll just leave as that also, and then we hit okay. So what this should do is it should bring our cylinder into the Mari interface. Put a checkerboard on it uh, for a second. No, it's pretty quick, I didn't do that. Um, on some softwares like Nuke and Mari are kind of, they're made by the same company. There are certain things that can just trigger them to not like you. Like if you have an underscore, or if you have a dash, if you have a space in your name, um, it doesn't like those things. So try to eliminate those when you do stuff. All right, so just so you can see the interface for this, I want you to think of 3D and Photoshop kind of coming together, right? So over on the right, we have channels. So what the channels are is us painting a specific channel. Now it says color, but for what we're doing, it's not going to mean anything except for an area um, that we're going to export, okay? Yes, sir. All right, just take notes then. That's a couple of them are doing that. Um, on the bottom right, you'll see where it says layers. You can consider those to be exactly like layers. So as we're painting something, we may want to paint it in layers. Um, let's say we have a metal. We may want to paint just a flat metal on the bottom. And then we decide, okay, well now I want to add some graffiti to it. So I make a new layer, I add graffiti. That way in case I don't like the graffiti, I can just take it off. If I want to add scratches, I can paint scratches. I don't like them, I can take it off, okay? So that's what we can do with these layers. Um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that goes into that as well. For now, we don't need to play with it too much, all right? Um, my screen is kind of squished because it's going through the projector, so yours is going to look a little bit different. Uh, I'm going to kind of pull off some of these that I, I'm going to need. I'm just going to pull these into this just so I can see all that stuff there. Come on. There we go. Okay. All right, so this is what was over there. I just pulled it off so I can see it better. Um, so we have our channels. We also have an image manager. The strong suit of Mari is it allows us to take images from the internet, drop them in here, and it allows us to paint right on top of them. Um, we also have shaders. Typically, we don't need to play with this too much. And then we have a shelf, and this is really confusing. The shelf is where your brushes are, okay? So anytime we need to tweak a brush or add a brush or whatever, we would go to the shelf. Um, these are things that we could use. Um, if you ever used a Photoshop brush or made your own Photoshop brush, the same thing. You could drop these into there and use different kinds of brushes. So if you wanna paint on scratches, you could download a scratches brush and paint with scratches. Some of these are pretty nice because you don't want to always paint with this. Like if you paint with these things here, they're always going to look kind of soft and um, not really crisp. Uh, you go to like the hard surface one, you get some neat things to paint with. And then of course there's some organic ones, Brad's new brushes. Okay, lots of different brushes you can download and use and add and whatever else. All right, so I'm gonna throw that off to the side. Um, so here's the layers. So this is on the bottom of yours. So we have layers. Um, which is add new layer, add layer mask, just like we have in Photoshop, uh, adjustment layers, procedural layers, okay? So I could take my metal, and on top of my metal, I could add like a noise pattern, just so it's kind of like scuffed up a little bit. Um, under the projection, this is how everything's going to get projected. So as I paint onto the surface, 
it's projecting that texture on there. So I have to make sure that that projection is top quality, otherwise it doesn't work. Now, the cool thing about this are these down here. All of these kinds of masks, this is where you could really get into some really cool um, uh, ways to paint your stuff. So one of them is like a um, ambient occlusion mask. So if I have a character, where'd my guy go? I closed him, I deleted him, what did I do with him? I put him right here, there he is. All right, so if I'm trying to paint this guy, and let's say inside of each of these crevices, I want to maybe add um, a little bit of darkness or a little bit of scratching even further in there, I could use an ambient occlusion mask to do that. Because what it does is it finds all of these areas that are close to each other and basically doesn't allow you to paint on them. Or I inverse it and it does allow you to paint on them, okay? So I could paint just in these crevices here what I want. Now think of like a soldier or think of um, uh, something with a lot of, of specific detail to it. If I had armor on, my armor is gonna be scuffed up usually like in these certain areas. So I could use masks to isolate those certain areas that would have scuffs and then paint right on top of those, okay? So lots of cool things you can do with these. Um, we also have painting, so this is actually how the paint goes on. History of what we've been doing, and then colors, okay? So what we're gonna do is, um, first let's do just like we've done in Maya before, is spin around. So navigation is the same exact thing, okay? Alt, left, middle, and right allows us to do exactly what Maya would allow us to do. One of the differences though is that it has some pretty sweet hotkeys for going right to the front, side, or top view. If you just use one through six, one, two, three, four, five, six, it actually jumps you to a front view, side view, top view. Okay, so if you're trying to paint um, right on the side of it, you don't want some weird angle like this as you're painting, you could just hit one of those hotkeys and jump right to that side view, okay? All right, so this is the orthographic. So we're not getting any kind of perspective in here. If I jump to perspective, there it goes, we would get perspective. You typically don't want to actually paint in perspective mode because your brush will be distorted. Orthographic does not have any distortion. We also have ortho and UV. So here's our image, here's our UV. So we could actually paint right on top of those. We could also just look at the UVs and paint on top of those, okay? So what we want to do is paint right on top of this. So go to your color palette, pick a color, and then just paint right on the surface of it. Okay, so pick a color, paint on top of the surface. So this is kind of like uh, mud box? Yeah. Uh, mud box can do this too and so can ZBrush, so it's similar to it. Uh, but this one, we're going to output textures that are writing directly to the UVs. Now, you may have noticed you painted on it, and then you may have spun around. The second you hit the Alt key, those changes that you've done, that painting, actually gets written to your file. Okay? So when I spin around, watch down here. I'm going to just do a little stroke. And when I hit Alt, I go into this mode where it's writing out those files. Okay, now that's important because if I were to go here and start to draw stuff, and then I went over here to this incredibly stupid toolbar and I grabbed the eraser and I started erasing stuff, that's fine. But look at what I can't erase, right? I can't erase the other stuff that I already did because that's already locked into my texture. Okay, so some of these tools, we just have to get used to how they work. When I hit Alt, my texture's now locked in and baking it in there, okay? So how would you undo it? Um, you wouldn't undo it, you would paint the texture back on top of it. Okay. That's why I'm talking about using the layers uh -huh. as a method to do that, building up from a base so that you don't have to worry about, oh, I've accidentally overwritten a scale texture I spent 20 minutes trying to line up perfectly right. on my snake. Don't you need your alt key to change views? You don't. You can have one through six. Right, you can use one through six, but those will do it too, okay? Mm -hmm. Anytime we're using, um, I gotta switch back to my brush, there it is. Uh, anytime I'm painting, I would paint, I would hit Alt, that locks it in, and then I would spin around, okay? It has to lock it in before we move the camera. 
because of how it's projecting it on there, it has to do that. Now, if I go like this, I'm gonna kind of zoom in a little bit, and I start to paint here, and then I start to spin around, you can see how it left that really hard edge right there, okay? So one of the things we don't wanna do is ever really paint near the edges, because when we paint near the edges, what's gonna happen is we're gonna get this. And if we paint near the edges with a texture, it's going to streak it just like our planar map did, okay? Because all this is, all that tiny circle is, is a little planar map. And as we paint, it's planar mapping that texture or whatever that color is right into that spot. Now you'll see one of the nice things I like about Mari are the hotkeys are right here. So here's the radius, rotate, which doesn't help in this case, the opacity and the squish. So if we hold down R and we left click and drag, we can make the brush bigger or smaller. If we hold down O, we right click and or left click and drag, we can change the opacity of the brush. If we hit Q, uh, click and drag, then we can change the squish. I've never changed the squish of a brush before. All right, so that's that, okay? Um, now let's go into this thing, into your image manager, and what you're gonna do is you're gonna grab one of your textures. So grab that metal texture and just drop it on there. Okay, and you literally just drag that metal texture right inside of the project area. Okay, right inside of this image manager. just your image in your folder. All right, now once these are inside of this area, they're available to us to paint. So then we can go ahead and use these as basically painting the texture on here. So if I grab that metal and I drag it onto my work area, you'll see that that metal surface now gets on top of it. So drag your metal texture right on top of your work area. Okay. Now once it does that, it's kind of like too big to work with. Again, we have the hot keys right here. We have the ability to change the radius of our brush, the rotate, the opacity, the squish of our brush. Then we can also change the image size. So scaling the image, moving the image, rotating the image, um, stamping the image, and then whatever else that far right one says. Start repeat image, okay? I believe that one is semicolon. All right, so I'm gonna hold Control Shift. That turns it to a double arrow, and then I can click and drag to shrink it down. You may not have to shrink yours as much as I do. Okay, so hold Control Shift, shrink it down. Now, just like the UV editor, our workspace is basically a texture, okay? What that means is if I zoom way out like this, and I shrink, make this incredibly big and I try to paint that, the texture is gonna be super tiny. And when you put it on there, it's gonna stretch it out and it's gonna look horrible. So when you paint, you have to find like a good size to be painting on, okay? So usually I try to paint, you know, that looks pretty good, okay? I'll shrink this down like that. You want to be able to spin around your object without having to zoom in and out, okay? We can't zoom in and out, because if I zoom in and I paint something, it's gonna be finer detail than if I zoom out and paint something, okay? So I'm gonna make sure that my cylinder is covered by my metal, and I'm just going to paint. Okay, so I'm just clicking and dragging and painting that texture right on top of it. Uh, remember, Alt's going to lock that in, but then you can take a look at it and spin around and see, you know, what does it look like. And you'll see the advantage of this right away is that all those corners that were not looking very good, 
now they're going to look really good because we can get in there and start to paint exactly what we want the corners to look like. So just play around too while you're doing this and like rotate the image, move the image, paint different areas of this. Nope, right when I'm on top of it like this, it's painting right under there. So it's just like right onto that is what it paints. So you don't have to hold down Alt or anything, it just goes right there. Now there is like a clone brush, so I could use that too, but you don't need to. Not with this method anyway. I want to let me paint the bottom. The bottom's blacked out. Uh, the bottom's blacked out because there's no light underneath. Um, don't worry about the bottom for now, but we'll get into that. It's another one of the stupid things about it. Um, What's the benefit of using Mari over ZBrush? With Mari, this is strictly texture creation. So when we're done with this, we export it out and we get textures. Okay, This is actually painting it to the UVs. When you're in ZBrush, what happens is it paints it to the vertices. Okay, So when you paint red, you're painting that vertice red and this one blue and this one green. And here it's all strictly based on UV. So it actually goes a little bit quicker, um, and you have a lot more abilities, uh, personally, I think, in here than you would inside of ZBrush, especially with the layering, which you don't have in ZBrush, um, and some of the other functionality. Um, so I prefer doing any kind of texture map like that inside here. Now, just so you can see it too, watch how fast I could actually texture all of that stuff, because you guys were in the ortho view, spinning around and painting, spinning around and painting. So if I go to UV, I painted the entire thing. <laughs> All right, now that doesn't line up. That's the pretty much the exact same thing as going into Maya and dropping the texture on there. It's still not gonna line up, but my work is now cut basically in half because I don't have to go through and try to line up the entire thing. I mainly have to focus on that, that, and then the edge, right? So when I get in here and I say, oops, there's a problem area, I can just zoom in on it. Oops, come on. Maybe I'll rotate the image a bit. Maybe make it a little bigger. And now I'm just basically just brushing out and waiting. <laughs> just on the top tab where it says Projects UV. Uh, you're thinking about stuff. 